Welcome to Vendetta Sports Media. This is Eight Sided Freaks, and today we have a UFC pay per view to preview. Um, pretty unanimous opinion among the group. These are some of our favorite episodes to record. We've got five fights, um, a handful of very, very impactful fights, obviously a title fight, but overall five good fights. This is a solid pay per view going down to Australia. And they're taking Izzy, who's one of the biggest stars in the region, Kaka France, Steve Ursig, Tai Tuivasa. So a lot of regional talent, uh, Dan Hooker as well, but also a lot of high level talent in some of these guys and some of the guys are fighting. So a uh, great card this weekend in Australia. Um, I kind of want to lead it off here. We're obviously going to preview the card, actually. Um, we'll start at the main event, work our way down, provide a final thoughts for the prelims. So. If no one's watched our uh, previews before, that is the plan of action. Uh, Today, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, We'll start with the main event, like I said. And I kind of want to start this off with, this is a big rivalry, obviously, between Israel Adesanya and Drikas Duplessis. Where does this fight sit in in terms of anticipation? Because I feel like it's a fight some people are very, very excited for. Some people, I imagine, aren't as excited. So as far as title fights go this year, where does this one uh, sit for you guys in terms of how excited you are? Um, Anthony, we can swing it over to you first. I'd, I'd put it, at, um, you know, it's a B. It's not like the most exciting, uh, you know, one of the most exciting fights they could make. And um, it's definitely not average. You know, Izzy's, um, you know, was a star at one point. Obviously, I think still, just not as not to the height or level of he was at, but I think still can pull in a big audience. And then with uh, DDP, I think it's in a sense too for Izzy, someone that defended that belt so many times. It's uh, some fresh blood, so a completely new look and uh, at a new opponent. And I know there was some beef there, which the only reason I think this fight's gone down a little bit is because the beef kind of died down a little bit, the original hype and stuff like that. Um, but overall, I, I would say, um, you know, this is definitely, definitely an interesting fight, definitely a fun one, so, something you'd look forward to being a main event. And I think it helps that there's been uh, a lack of fight night or solid fight night cards and stuff that will take this, um, from what could be okay to even just, you know, semi exciting for, for some people that have been, uh, you know, going through the drought. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you completely, especially off that last thing you said, we looked at the card, Last week, James and I barely even previewed it on last week's episode. It was just one of those ones There's, it's there. Fights themselves didn't live up to any expectations whatsoever. So just coming into this, you're going to throw us any title fight and it'd be a little more exciting. But I'm also with you, Anthony. It's like I'm more excited for the press conference of this one and the weigh-ins, them getting before the actual fight itself. Just because I could see this fight being relatively boring. I think it could be a very much Israel Adesanya trying to do what he used to do really well. Jab and stick and kind of get out of the way and avoid the big shots from Duplessis, avoid the takedowns. So it's for that, like I guess the B B plus range maybe for excitement for me. It's I'm excited for it, but I think there's some other fights on this card that I'm more intrigued about. Yeah, um, I agree with a lot of what you guys said. So I won't echo um, too much, but um, I, I do think this buildup will actually get a little bit more intense. We're recording on Wednesday night, um, mm-hmm. so we've got the press conference and media days here right around the corner. Uh, so I think this is actually going to heat up within the next 24 hours um, in terms of rivalry things. I imagine some things will be said by both guys. We've got the press conference coming up, so I do think it's going to heat up a little bit uh, in that regard. But the one thing that um, I like about this fight that neither of you guys touched on is that I think it's going to be really important for the landscape of this division. Every championship fight is. Um, but I just think that when you look like Israel Adesanya is already a guy who is discussed as a top three, top two middleweight of all time. You know, he's on the very, very short list of middleweights. So this fight in terms of legacy and greatest middleweights of all time and conversations like that. Um, very, very important if Izzy can get this belt back for what it can do for his legacy. And then, you know, 
say he wins this fight and then gets a Strickland fight and then wins that, kind of scrapes that um, w- loss. You're not it's scraping it off, but in a way you're kind of getting some redemption. So I do think there's a path where this is a crucial, crucial fight for Izzy, where on the contrast, if he loses the DDP, now what are you doing with Izzy? You can't put him back in another title fight. Um, and now you've got DDP who's taking out Strickland and Izzy, and he's now starting to get a nice little uh, – starting to get the wheels on the title reign. So I do think this is a very important fight for um, this division's current landscape and historical landscape, more specifically on the Izzy side. So that's one thing that I just, things like that, probably because I'm such a MMA nerd and some of that stuff really intrigues me as to how we're going to look back on some of these guys in five and 10 years. You know, so in that regard, uh, I think this fight is very interesting and, um, some of the things you guys said, like like I said, I agree with. But that's one thing that kind of stands out to me that makes this one a little bit more unique. Still don't think it's like A-plus in terms of intrigue. I would probably agree in the B, B-plus range maybe. But, uh, yeah, uh, so history is is my one thing that kind of really intrigues me here. So, And then um, just, just bounced off that, you look at his, the fight he had before the Sean Strickland fight where he knocked out Robert Whitaker. If not many people have beaten both Robert Whitaker and Israel Adesanya. I don't actually think anyone has. So that's just another historic thing. And that goes to what you're saying. Of where do you throw DDP into the landscape of the best uh, middleweights of all time? I know it's still early. He hasn't done any, has, doesn't have any title defenses. But just that resume he already has, beating three former champions, is pretty impressive. And Izzy needs something big. If he, if he loses, I think it could be some a sign of, Maybe he's going to leave the middleweight division, go and chase Alex Pereira at light heavyweight. That's something I could see possibly down the line. So, Yeah. Um, all right. As far as this fight itself goes, betting odds have been creeping closer and closer. So a couple of days ago, I'll say Monday, start of the week, uh, DDP was about a plus 130, plus 120 underdog, depending on where you look. Um, like I said, Wednesday night. Um, but this has creeped closer and closer and closer to a pick 'em. Right now, most popular line is probably minus 105 on the Duplessis side, minus 115 on the Izzy side. Some places have it split 110 apiece. Some places have it a little bit bigger on the uh, have Adesanya as a tad bit of a bigger favorite in the plus 120, or excuse me, minus 120. Minus 125 range. So, point being, very, very close odds and odds that are getting closer um, as we creep closer to the fight. So, very close fight. Um, Jerry, we can throw it over to you first this time. Um, what are you looking forward to as far as the actual skills and things of, of, of that nature go? I mean, I think the kind of the way to beat Israel Adesanya it was really show. I know he was, was really shown by both Sean Strickland and Jan Blahovic, and I think the Jan Blahovic style of how he beat Israel Adesanya is what I'm expecting from DDP. I'm expecting him to come in, try and take down Izzy. We saw Izzy get taken down against Alex Pereira, who I think only has maybe one other takedown in his UFC career. <clears throat> For the Sean Strickland fight, he kind of just kept walking down Izzy and kept doing that, which I don't think Izzy will let happen again. I think he overlooked Sean Strickland a little bit, like we all kind of did, and didn't expect him to show that fire. DDP has that fire. He has that power. It's the takedowns is where I think he's going to have to get it going because otherwise, like I said earlier, I think Adesanya, for him to win this fight, he's going to have to jab and move and stay away from those takedowns and just outstrike him and do what we've seen him do time and time again in title fights. Yeah, I agree with – um well, first, I do agree with what you said earlier, too. Uh, I think Adesanya's game plan is to make it kind of the older game plans he's had in title fights, a la... That's why I'm, I'm worried this fight, I could see it also as well, not being the most entertaining, because if it turns into a Romero, uh, versus a Romero fight, we're always on the outside and stuff like that. But um, I will say DDP does charge in, though, um, at times, and obviously Whitaker in the first fight, that was one of his uh, big ways to try to make things happen and uh, Adestani was just picking them apart with the uh, counters and stuff. But I also agree. Like you said, um, I think the wrestling is um, 
it should be the main, you know, focus for DDP. Not only because does he have strength and power, but um, he's actually a pretty good crafty uh, wrestler on the ground with reversals and stuff. So, and he's a, and he's a pretty big man too, for, 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 for compared to some people in that weight class. Um, and Jan in their fight wasn't even, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, I don't remember any significant ground and pound or chasing submissions or anything. It was kind of just wet blanket. Um, he was heavier, had the, had the size advantage, and kind of just was able to hold him down. So I, I think uh, if DDP can win some exchanges but avoid, um, you know, getting really caught bad and then eventually uh, mixing in a couple takedowns, take a minute or two off around, just, um, uh, you know, staying on top or uh, maintaining control, then I can definitely see a, a DDP uh, winning this fight. Yeah, and um, I, I kind of have a lot to say, so this may get a little rambly. Um, anyone who has listened to previews before knows I can go off the deep end a little bit, especially for uh, title fights. But um, I agree with uh, a lot of the things you guys said, um, sp- specifically on what Izzy needs to do to win. I don't think I'm bringing anything um, that you guys didn't say. But I think it's going to be, you know, the jab and leg kicks are going to be crucial. He's going to – I think it needs to be like a Paulo Costa style of mm-hmm. heavy feints, um, jabs, kicks, like he's just got to be constantly touching, touching, touching. I, I think that is going to be a, a style that leads success. I don't know that it's going to lead to a knockout like it did against Costa, um, but he's got to be constantly touching him. And the other thing um, is he just absolutely has to land counters because mm-hmm. we've seen DDP. And one of the things that I didn't like, I, I've picked against DDP and, Shit, every single fight he's had in, in recent memory because he's there to be countered and he's throwing, you know, two, three, four punch combinations that are just big, big swings. Um, and that gives you chances to counter him. And maybe Izzy can land those counters. Maybe he can't. But the difference in between that, I think, is what wins on the fight or loses in the fight. Because if, if he's landing counters, he's now doing damage, landing shots, winning rounds maybe finding a knockout. Um, but if he's not, then it's just letting Duplessis come forward and just consistently he's forward, forward, throwing, throwing. And, like, that is just so – it wears on people so fast in every single fight. Like, no matter how sloppy it looks, all of a sudden the other fighter that he's fighting is so tired because they've just been under, like, constant, like, stress of getting hit with one of these big shots. Um, and then all of a sudden they look sloppier than Duplessis. Um, and he has a good chin. So even if you land some of these counters, you might not be able to uh, knock him out. So I, I think, but regardless, I think those counters are going to be crucial for Izzy. I think if he doesn't land those counters, I, I don't think he wins the fight. Um, another thing I, I will add is well, for Izzy against Sean, he just simply spent way too much time in between the fence and the black line on the outside of the octagon. I would love for someone to just go and like count that and just come up with a percentage of time that was in between the fence and that black line. I bet the number would be shocking. Once again, if he does that here, he's going to get, I mean, Duplessis is going to land those big, big swings because then he can't go backwards to uh, uh, get out of the way of those. So it's another piece of the striking. And as far as grappling goes, like you guys said, Duplessis, if he can grapple here, obviously opens up a great path for him. Um, and if you just look at the guys Izzy has fought, you could make a case that Duplessis is the best grappler of the bunch. Um, if he's not, it would be like a Yoel Romero who didn't use it, so it doesn't really matter. Or you could say maybe Robert Whitaker, but Duplessis took down Whitaker. Duplessis is at least a different grappler in the sense where he's bigger, more physical. Let's focus on technique. So he's just going to try and out physical Izzy, which I think is a better path to taking him down. So, um, and then once he gets on top, passes, lands big shot. So I, I do actually think that DDP wins this fight. And I think it is because uh, of that grappling. I think close rounds, where it's DDP landing some of his big swings, Izzy landing some counters, you know, Izzy landing some jabs, some leg kicks. It's a close 50 50 round on the feet. Then DDP gets a takedown. 
and he'll throw ground and pound to win a round. So I think that is the type of thing that in a close fight, I mean, it's like I said earlier, it's, you know, pick them odds, basically. Um, I mean, you're looking at the guy with, I think, a pretty big path to success just purely based off grappling. So. Yeah, and I do want to just bounce one other thing uh, for me that kind of I think I'm going to pick DDP at the moment, but still plenty of time before we get the prediction out. But for Izzy, one big advantage he has, his last 11 fights have been title fights. And he's fought the best of the best in this division. DDP has fought just Sean Strickland as, as far as title fights. It's very different, I would expect. And all this rivalry, all this talk and talk about that, I wonder if that goes to his head a little bit. And that's something I'm just intrigued to see kind of how it plays out throughout fight week of the attitude of both of them. Because it sounds like Izzy's looking more focused than he ha did for the Sean Strickland fight from everything I've seen online and through the embedded videos. But it's easy to say that when it's just social media and what they want out there. But that's just something in the back of my mind is he has this championship experience it's in his backyard, so I could very well see him doing something here to re-secure the title for a third time. Yeah, that's why it's tough because I want to say that's the one thing. And there's also the whole question if you think Izzy's, um, you know, on the come down a little bit over the, not over the cliff as, of course, he's washed because I think that's it would be pretty wild to say, but that he's essentially out of his prime, though, for sure. After now, he's stacking up, kind of lost every other fight and stuff, give or take, like you just said, Jerry, fighting the best, though. But uh, he lost to Yawn, I think came back with a win against Vittori or whatever, but uh, lost to Pereira, came back, beat him in the rematch, and so now just lost to Strickland. So at least he has a pretty good track record of, um, you know, of coming back in his next fight at still a high level, everything, not completely, um, you know, letting everything um, snowball or anything. So it's, I guess it's up to if you think he can get back to that glory. And then just with the wrestling too, I wanted to say Adesanya is not a bad like defensive wrestler too. I think it, it happens when your striking is so good or you specialize at one thing, people like take that excellence you have as a striker and then be like, oh, if he's that good at that, he must not be able to like wrestle and stuff. So I, I do think even because Whitaker in the Adesanya fight in the rematch uh, tried to mix in a good amount more wrestling and Adesanya was uh, really good at um, defending those and stuff. So I think even if um, like DDP is going to have to win some striking uh, exchanges in this fight, obviously I don't think he can quite do the whole straight wrestling game plan because I think Adesanya, uh, I believe in his defensive wrestling enough to stay up. However, uh, I will say, I was thinking that same thing though, James, that DDP honestly might be the best wrestler that he's faced, which uh, which is saying something. And then also, I think maybe not even with clinch or throws or takedowns, but I just do think as well that size advantage, you can outmuscle him and stuff. Because even though he's not um, like the most technical, like technically like flawless wrestler, when you're that big, DDP can still kind of get people down and stuff. So we'll yeah. see. Um, a lot of his takedowns are like shades of like he's just going out there attempting double legs, some single legs. Went out there, landed the Clint, uh, the toss against Whitaker. So it's not this is an every single takedown, but he's got takedowns against Strickland where he's just like double legs that look more like tackles. To be like, it's just like, and it's a large commitment from a fit, big physical guy, and it works. So, um, and. I liked what you said, Anthony, about how he has to win some of these striking exchanges. Because I think one of the reasons Izzy has had defensive grappling success is because he was so – he was in such a good position on the feet. Like, for example, Marvin Vittori was only going to go – and we'll throw Derek Brunson into this as well. Those guys were only going to find success grappling. They would, the chances that they found striking success were horrible. And they had no chance of grappling. Well, Marvin took the back at one point, but for 25 minutes, he had two minutes at most of success. So um, these guys who, when the grappling's predictable and when he doesn't have to worry about the striking, it makes it 10 times easier for him to defend those, uh, those grappling attempts. So I like what you said there. Um, but one thing that I, I want to circle back to this that you said, Jerry, is I think 
like Izzy's Izzy's motivation is going to be like a a fairly big factor here because to me you can't convince me that the guy who fought Alex Pereira the second time is the same guy from a mindset perspective that Sean, fought Sean Strickland. I mean, just the pure in, intensity, focus. Obviously, I'm watching this through a screen, so maybe I'm off here, and maybe people around him couldn't notice a difference. Um, but it felt a lot more focused. It felt like what he was doing was more intentional against Pereira. And against Strickland, it just felt like Strickland was there because Duplessis wasn't. And it just felt like, oh, Strickland's just going to walk out here, get, you know, pieced up to the tune of a 50-45, and we're all going to go home. Um, and that's not what happened. So, and, and I just don't see Izzy coming with that same mentality against Duplessis, who he clearly does not like. And if anything, Duplessis' mindset here is kind of more reminiscent of what Izzy's looked like against Sean. Like he was talking about how Izzy's going to have to retire – and at, like, the one press conference that they already did, he made the joke about, oh, good thing you're golfing. You know, that's a retired man's sport. Like, stuff like that. Like, I feel like Drickus, I don't know if it's a bad thing necessarily, but I think he's almost the one looking past Izzy rather than Izzy's the one coming into this. Appears to be, in terms of focus, a little bit closer to that Pereira rematch rather than the most recent Strickland fight, which I think for, you know, an Adesanya fan is exactly what you want to see. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of what I'm wondering if that's the big question of is he actually going to be that motivated to go and bring the fight to DDP and not let DDP put the pressure on like we saw Sean Strickland do? I did want to say to – didn't I see – I thought I saw something that regardless of how this fight plays out, though, they said Sean uh, Strickland gets the winner. Yeah, well, uh, Will Whitaker's out there doing the heavy lifting. Strickland gets the win. Yeah. Um, I would actually not be mad at that if Izzy wins, wins just based off that storyline. Like, I don't like it, but I'll accept it. But if Duplessis wins, do we really need to see that fight again? Like, you I mean, can't it was convince me that we need to see that fight again. Controversial, right? Or people think it could have yeah. gone anyway. I know I'm not sitting here like I'm dying to see it, but yeah. – I'm gonna just throw I think there are people who are. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to just throw this crazy thought out there. Say Izzy wins. If he loses to Sean Strickland again, does he retire? Oh, fuck it. Might as well. You lost to Strickland twice. <laughs> <laughs> retire. Yeah, yeah. Might as well, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that one's also more intriguing than if Robert Whitaker beats Hamzat, I think. I think if Hamzat wins, he gets the title shot against either. Yeah. That's because They're looking that, for a way to screw Whitaker out of one. I yeah. just – I don't understand how you can be ranked like one, two, or three. You're finding someone that's unranked, right? Like so they sh – they're getting like the huge step up, all this stuff. You shouldn't – like you're doing this for, I guess, the love in your heart and for the company, blah, blah, blah. You then knock out the replacement. You are then rewarded with a rematch with the dude that is unranked, that is like – you, you're like getting punished for winning another fight. Like yeah. there's no – um, good thing happening there. Positive yeah. thing for Whitaker. It is crazy because Whitaker beat Paulo as well, who's Strickland's only win since losing the title. So it's not even like Strickland went out there and beat somebody who's like popping off the page in terms of title resume. Like, oh, now he deserves it. Like he beat Costa. And I, I think I like Costa more than most in terms of his skills. Um, well, what Costa did in the octagon, that I was not a fan of actually. That was bizarre. Um, but Point being, Whitaker beat the same guy, plus Ikra Maliskarov, and now he's fighting Hamza Chimai. So it's like, we're not only winning against the same guy, we're now stacking wins. Or they could just fight each other and we could all just be done with the conversation because one of them would win. But. I know. That was the other thing. I don't, for some reason, they're like avoiding that fight. And that's one of the only fights we haven't seen, too. Like a, in that division for Whitaker and Strickland now, who's fought a decent amount of people in that division. So I don't know if it's they're trying to hold off on it in the hopes, like I don't want to say in the hopes of that one of them gets the belt, but at least you know you can make that fight instantly if one of them gets the belt because it's never been done before. Um, yes, but um, I 
on him into a title fight against Strickland, who he has not fought, just from a Whitaker perspective. So maybe that's the logic, and then it would make more sense. But is it? Is it not? To the co-main event, we have a flyweight fight between mm-hmm. two Australians. We've got Aussie on Aussie violence in Perth. Actually, is Kai Kai? Kai's, Kai's, Kai's from New Zealand, so it's some New Zealand and Aussie violence, which makes it even better. <laughs> that is true. Um, still, we rarely see guys from uh, this from that oceanic region fight each other in co-main events and main events. So it is still fairly rare. Um, all right. Uh, so Ursay coming back from his loss to Pantoja, three and one in the UFC, gets rushed to the title fight. Rushed as in. You know, maybe needed one more, um, but 3 0, impressive finish of a match now. Goes out there, close fight against Pantoja, loses. Kai Car France um, runs to the top of the division um, after a lengthy UFC career. And then he gets there, interim title fight against Moreno, gets, loses that fight. Goes out there against Amir Albazi, looking to get back in the win column. Absolute robbery. He won that fight. Judges gave it to Albazi. Um, I scored it for Kai that night. I scored it for Kai again when I rewatched it this week in preparation for the show and the preview. So um, Kai won that fight pretty clearly. I'd rather score that fight 49-46 for Kai rather for Albazi. Uh, but regardless, um, he needs to crack a losing streak as well. So um, two division looking to get back in the win column. As far as the odds go, um, this is another one that we have seen movement on since the start of the week. Kai Car France was in the plus 160 range to start the week. Now here on Wednesday, we are down to Kai Car France plus 136. Steve, 62. So fairly close line as well. Nothing crazy, um, but Ursag opening as the favorite off of a uh, loss in the title. So. I think this is a close fight. What do you guys make of this uh, flyweight co-main event? Uh, Jerry, I think it is your turn to uh, lead us off here. Right. Yeah, I said before when we were asking, you asked about how excited I am for the main event, and I said there's a couple other fights that intrigue me more. This is one of them. Solely because had Kai Car France not been robbed against Amir Albazi, I know he ended up getting hurt, but he probably would have fought for the belt since a year ago. Because, I mean, it was June 3rd, I think, was when that Albazi fight happened. Probably would have been next in line for a title shot. Instead, loses that. Now has to work his way back up a bit, and it is the injury. So I'm not sure I'm, how he's going to look coming out there. Because I really enjoyed watching Kai Kara France for the last few fights of his win streak before that Moreno fight. thought he was going to be a challenger to Moreno, but those leg kicks and the, or the body kicks were just nasty. Steve Ersig. I mean, we saw what he did in against Pantoja. Nothing really surprised us there. He made a huge jump up. Now this is kind of a step back, and this could be a much more intriguing fight for him. See where he really stacks up against not just the champion in Rio. That's a tough fight. He took it on relatively shorter notice. Now he has a full camp training for one guy specifically. It's not the title holder. It's a guy who is a, another stepping stone for Ursig to get back to that title picture. And that's why this fight intrigues me so much is it's just going to be one of those ones that the hatred between New Zealand and Australia might come out. Part of me, it maybe is just, that's just hopeful that we see these two come after it and just go balls to the wall and see what happens. Ursig's fighting in front of his entire, his hometown of Perth. So that just adds another element to it. And I just think I'm excited for a fun, fast flyweight bout. I think this will be very strike heavy and go pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree. That was going to be uh, my main thing was that just this is a perfect uh, fight for flyweight, hopefully to get the division back going again with just everything that's been happening with injuries. Like you said, maybe like a bad decision here or there. I mean, the Mokai of stuff like the people that are supposed to be the next wave of prospects, not really just living up to things. Um, so overall, yeah, we've been dying to see Kai Car France fight again. Uh, we all think he's an entertaining fighter. He's finally back. That's perfect. Steve Ursag. Now, I think 
maybe to uh, a lot of people too, it could have been their first, um, you know, their first run in with him for that belt fight. So after you got that huge push from him, now I think if people liked what they saw in that fight, they might be more inclined to be like, okay, now I finally get to see him again, fight again now after seeing that first one. So just overall, um, and then obviously heavy stakes because one of these people might uh, very well fight for the belt soon uh, in a fight or two. So just overall, this is a this would be an important fight at any uh, weight class. But I think it's really good that it's the flyweight, uh, hopefully getting things back going again and um, trying to still leave that Figgy uh, Moreno era a little bit too. I know Pantoja obviously has some defenses, but um, just that huge log jam for those uh, you know three years now. Um, as we get further from that, it's good to see uh, these type of fights. And these type of fights be co-mains, too, if they really want to keep that uh, division going. That, that this is a co-main fight uh, to an Israel Adesanya versus Driscus Duplessis, which is probably going to be one of the bigger fights of the year. You know, we'll say, you know, at worst, it's a, it's a pay-per-view that people are probably going to watch. It's not like it's a pay-per-view where a lot of people are going to skip out on it. This is going to have eyes on it. Um, and these guys are a co-main event slot. And I'm a guy who I've been about wanting to see better um, bout order for these flyweights. Um, this has one been one of my biggest complaints. And in a lot of these cards, we often see it more common on flyweight, uh, or excuse me, on fight nights that are not pay-per-views. They'll throw two ranked flyweights on the prelims. We've got unranked heavyweights on the on the main card. Um and to me, that's just a bad way to go about this division. I think this division is exciting. And the reason that, that more people don't watch is because it doesn't get um, the respect in terms of bout order. And the roster size is simply smaller. Um, I think the difference between 125ers and 135ers to where Sean O'Malley is headlining the sphere and 125ers can't get a decent placement out of regular card i mean obviously sean o'malley is a different level of star for that division but you know that division is in a great spot 135 so um that's a little bit of a, a side rant here but i lo- and that's one of the reasons i love this fight because I, I hope it does well i hope it's a great fight i hope it's fight of the night um and i think it can be because i think these guys are fairly evenly matched in terms of skill like to me i had a hard time um, I already wrote the preview for this bout. I had a hard time, like, planting a fa- flag heavily on either side. Like, I-, I just think it's a hard fight to be very passionate about when Ursaic has looked great in the UFC. I love his movement, great footwork, gets in and out, good hands. He grappled well against Pantoja. Uh, he didn't win in all of those grappling exchanges, but did the grapple for that long with uh, Pantoja. So it was impressive. And um, for the Kai Car France side, he's a guy, he's a banger. He's gone out there, done really well against wrestlers, defending takedowns. If you take him down and put him in a body triangle, you may be able to keep him there for three to five minutes. But it is hard to get him down to the ground um, and, and break that initial first wave of takedown defense. So I think it's an interesting matchup between two guys who are relatively even matched and i'm excited to watch it i i do lean towards kai car france and my re my biggest reasoning for that uh is because of his leg kicks i trust kai to go out there and kick the legs against a guy who kind of relies on his movement and then if he can make Ursa a little bit stationary i think he'll then end up landing shots after that so i think in about as long as they're on the feet for 15 minutes i think kai is gonna you know kick the legs pretty consistently that it'll work in the end of the second round he starts to land his shots uh more effectively that said would i be shocked if earth eggs just avoiding shots and and really using his movement to get in and out and land his jab and not get in a ton no that's a, a close fight but that is my lean a, a slight lean to the the kai car from the side oh I'll, i can go real quick too i just i like i said or like, I mean, we've all said, this is one of the ones, and I've always said my flyweights thing. I, it's more I just try to watch the fights and stuff. That's probably one of the weight classes where I'm the least tuned into. But uh, I would say I have a sh- 
But um, point point of what I said earlier, where they don't give these guys any decent bout order, it's that's part of the reason for that. Mm-hmm. It's like if that wasn't a thing that that was happening, then yeah, I'm like these guys. So sorry to interrupt you, but it's a no, no explanation like, of what we're just talking about. Like we'll we'll joke sometimes. I'll be working, so I can only really catch certain ones at certain times, and then um, so when I'm free to watch one, thank God they put a, you know unranked awful heavyweights that I can watch instead of maybe, yeah, some actual good flyweights. But I I would just say real quick, I just have the slight lean to Ursig right now. I do agree with everything you said with the, while I like Kaikara as the striker and stuff, I like Ursig enough as the striker, um, or the way you put it was 15 minutes. Uh, if this is standing for 15 minutes, obviously I think that would favor France. So I'm hoping... I still believe in Ursig as a striker, but I was just hoping that it wouldn't be standing for all 15 minutes is then why I have that slight lean towards him. But either way, um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you can go wrong here. I think it's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, just given my prediction, I think it's going to be a very close fight. I can see it going either way. And I mean, Kaikar France has lost a couple fights by submission. So maybe that is somewhere where Steve Ursig can take advantage of it and maybe get it to the ground. Cause he showed good skill against Pantoja, who's an outstanding grappler. But I'm still leaning, still leaning Kai Car friends. Because even in the Albazi fight, like I said, they scored that fight incorrectly. Um, but part of the reason rounds were close, period, uh, is because of that grappling. So it's not mm-hmm. like you know you, you got to look back one fight to see a guy use grappling to go out there and get get some favor on the judges' scorecards for uh, for. Kai conference it is. Our, right back in the grappling realm, we've got Gamrot. Um, Gamrot, one of the youngest, uh, not youngest, but he's a guy who's been a prospect for a long time, seemingly. Um, has been ranked in the top five for a long time. Um, it just keeps fighting back in the rankings, whether it's RDA, whether it's Dan Hooker. Um, guys, this is a fight that he is, you know, a similar type of fight that he's run into of similar times in terms of having to go backwards in the rankings. I um, mean, he's going to do it again, again here against Hooker, who is a guy who is violent and has fought a lot of the most violent fighters in this division, like Chandler, like Poirier, um, like Paul Felder, back when uh, Felder was one of the violent guys of this division. So um, Dan Hooker, but the likes of them all, got back in the win column his last time out against Shalen Turner. Go. We've got a sizable favorite in Mateusz Gamrot. Uh, minus 340. Looks like an about average line. Um, with the comeback on Dan Hooker is plus 270. So uh, pretty decent. Uh, I think it is your turn to lead us off. Um, what are you thinking when it comes to, to this lightweight scrap? Anthony, you're muted. I appreciate that. I, I was going to say, I was looking up, um, wanted to make sure the last fights were right. But um, this is a tough one. Like you said, uh, Hooker has fought a lot of killers in the division. And that's the other thing I would say is he's had a lot of great fights with the killers of the division, whether that be uh, Felder and those Poirier fights too, or that Poirier fight. So I do always find myself picking him. I think he's just a super cool guy too. And obviously I, I think he's an entertaining fighter. So I find myself picking him, and I find myself picking against Gamrot frequently because I think he can be boring. However, I I think I'm going to switch it up and just take Gamrot, knowing he's going to wrestle, knowing there's a chance it could be a little boring, and he's probably not going to do enough for a finish. Um, but as much as I'd want to see, you know, Hooker, uh, you know, with the be able to get his striking going and stuff. Uh, I, I do think Gamrot will probably win in the the striker versus wrestling battle hill here and get a lot of control time and stuff. And I know if you can, you could say like, oh, Hooker struggled with wrestlers too in the past, whether that be like Islam. But I mean, that was wasn't that like a week's notice or something, and like didn't train anything. And it's Islam, so I don't think that's quite fair. I do think he's, you know, obviously coherent and stuff and some defensive wrestling. Um, but overall, I just yeah, I just think Gamrot's gonna probably went out and sw- swarm him too much with maybe a little too many takedowns and get one and 
work work the control time and stuff. And and then you know, Gamera will throw a little bit too. I don't want to make him sound like he's completely one dimensional, but he's um, I think like we've seen in his last fights, usually somehow gets the or not somehow, but we'll find a way to get the uh, game plan going and get the wrestling going. Yeah, my my big concern for Dan Hooker. I know it's been over a year since he's last fought, but he was jumping around divisions and didn't seem like he had decided where he was going to stay. So I'm curious to see how he looks in this lightweight bout. Because, I mean, that Jalen Turner fight you brought up, James, that was a catch weight because Turner missed weight. So he's been bouncing all over weight classes of his last three fights. Gamera has been steady, and he's beat some tough dudes recently. I mean, RDA is never, never an easy fight. Also beat Jalen Turner and then beat Fiziv, which that was kind of that. Wasn't that a knee? Wasn't there an injury with that fight? one where uh, Fazeev threw, I think it was a right kick, and while he was throwing the right kick, his left knee popped. That's so it was right. like not even from like a block. It was like his yeah, knee gave out while he was kicking. Yeah, that's right. So there's that aspect of it also. It's been some good wins because he also beat Armin Sarukian recently. I am kind of leaning Dan Hooker to get the upset. But I can. That's only if he like goes out and looks like he has in previous fights that are years uh, years ago. Uh, realistically, I think Gamrot's going to be too big. I think he's going to get some takedowns and kind of just control the tempo of this fight and control Dan Hooker where he needs to, and grind out a decision like he's done recently and shown time and time again that he's capable of. Kind of a weird fight because he is very, very good. Um, you don't just win decisions over Saruki. Um, I will say I did score that fight for Saruki and thought he won that fight. Um, that said, I also thought uh, Gamera beat Garam Kutulatse in his UFC debut and they scored that fight or gave that fight to Kutulatse. So we're kind of, he's got one robbery win, one robbery loss kind of evens out as far as the record goes. But he landed, like, six takedowns against Armin. And, like, his cardio is ridiculous to where in a 25-minute fight, I think he went, like, six for 20 or something. I was looking at those stats earlier. But he not only landed a lot, but attempted a lot and got some control time. And that's in a 25-minute fight. When you put Gamera in a 15-minute fight, he can take his out. He, he's very good at taking the output that he would have over 25 minutes and scrunching that down into 15. Um, I think that's one thing that I really like about him. He's, he has great cardio, and he knows exactly how to push at the proper pace to get the most out of his cardio for the allotted minutes, whether it's a three or five minute or three or five round fight. Um, he's been a big favorite. This one, he's 40. He's minus 225 against RDA. He's minus 480. And he eats. Too um, he gets hit with big shots. He gets knocked down. And then it kind of becomes, I don't think panic wrestling is the right word. Um, he's very effective at it. But it kind of becomes a very like, I need to wrestle. I need to wrestle. I, I just got hit pretty clean. I need to wrestle. And it just becomes so panicky and and concerned to me where we've had these two fights in his last three where he's been a big favorite, and he goes out there and is getting hit by guys who are better strikers than him. Um, they're still both good wins because RDA is good. I think RDA is much better at 155 at this point in his career. Jalen Turner is also um, pretty talented as well. So I think those are both still good wins, but it, it does – raise concern knowing that camp out like he was doing early in his UFC run or does he go out there get hit a little bit too much and just edge out some close rounds either way he's winning the fight but I'm much more comfortable picking him and getting the first outcome rather than watching it on pins and needles going oh this is getting sketchy for for gamma so um that is the biggest issue I have here for Gamrat. Like I said, I think he wins both those outcomes. I just gave he wins. Um, but one day, someone's going to see one of these takedowns coming. Maybe someone can defend someone like, like Darius did. But 
one day someone's going to see these takedowns coming and land a big shot. Is it going to be Dan Hooker? Maybe. Maybe he lands a knee. Maybe he lands an uppercut. Maybe. So then he loses. But um, point being, Dan Hooker's got the got the power to do it, and Gamrod gets hit a lot. So I, I, my love, love concern for Gamrod is high, but I, I do think he wins here in this one. Well, was, oh, go ahead, Anthony. Oh no, I mean no, you can go first. I was gonna say, I mean, the other side of things for Gamrod that like makes this, I think, a must win for him is, and I guess Dan Hooker's the same. Dan Hooker's thirty four, Gamrod's thirty three. They're not the youngest guys. They're not the oldest in this division. But for Gamrod, who's ranked number five, there's already a backlog of top title contenders in this division. Islam's hurt, so we don't know. Armin's fighting. Charles, Justin Gaethje of Max Holloway, who could. Mm-hmm warrant a title shot at some point this is a must win for him if he wants to do anything in the fight for a belt in the next couple of years needs to win this and then needs to take down one of those top four guys because as you said earlier james i think it was you said it he keeps fighting down in the rankings and just needs something to get him out that boost to get him that little bit extra and going to dan hooker's backyard and beating a tough guy who in his own right, this is his kind of last shot to move towards the title as well. In this division, at least, it seems like that's something that would be very helpful and go a long way for him. Yeah, I th- I think um, one of my other things, too, would be with Dan Hooker. When it comes to Dan Hooker, though, all right, first, let me let me start with uh, let me start with Gamera. I think. So the wrestling's there. I think, like we're saying, probably edge out of wrestling and stuff. And we keep mentioning how he hasn't got that huge boost yet, especially after that big uh, Armin uh, win. Uh, he seems like he keeps fighting down or fighting mid-level, never really getting that pure shot up to kind of set him up for a title fight. And I think partly that's because he keeps winning these close uh, decisions, like James was saying. And he hasn't looked too dominant because it's hard to look dominant when you're when you're getting touched up, like at least once or twice around like damn like like, that was a pretty good shot like that could be you know that could be something serious so i think that would be my response to that and i do agree with him winning another close decision here unfortunately because um hooker for as fun as fights as he's had and he gets in firefights still not a total amount of knockouts though overall like obviously he does have the power to do it but uh consistently over time it's not it's not um I will say he has less knockouts on his record than you might think so far in his uh, UFC career. So while I don't doubt that he can do it, I'm probably going to err on the side of another close decision uh, from Gamera and Hooker while landing great shots, great strikes, maybe making entertaining at points, ultimately not finding that, that finish. The Dan Hooker side, last knockout win was Claudio Puelles. And that doesn't um, count. 2022, but yeah, that's was <laughs> really, that's honestly what I was gonna say. Like, Puelles was just rolling for leg locks and and wasn't getting them, and just that he lost. It was gonna be a loss after that point. But then you have to go back to 2019, James Vick. Did we count that? Like, that's one of the worst chins we've seen in that's, our history of watching the sport. Like, that's Johnny Walker mm-hmm. levels of getting KO'd too. You got to respect the highlight reels of knockouts and getting knocked out. His, hey, he added a special one in karate combat. He yeah, got I was going to say, what, what, wasn't, that him, wasn't that Vic who got lights out in that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, right. And there's a karate combat reference. I'll check that one off the list. Um, all right. But then 2018, he also got a knockout over Gilbert Burns, which Gilbert Burns, 170 pounder fighting at 155. So, like, then before that, Jim Miller. So we can give him that one. Jim Miller, legit lightweight, 2018. So um, point being, it has been a while. And a lot of these you can go, yeah, he knocked them out. But and that's, that's really not um, something you want to be doing. Um, one thing I will quickly add on Hooker before we move on to the next fight. He does have competent grappler. He's not an awful grappler. Um Landed some takedowns, landed at least a couple against uh, Jalen Turner. He went out there, used uh, takedowns to beat Masret Hasperas, um, landed some takedowns against uh, Dustin Poirier. Like, he is a grappler, 
at all. Um, we did Chev. But um slides it's it's like him as like a defensive grappler, like expecting him to go out there and get into the sub in any fight, aside from Michael Chav on a week notice, but like, oh I know I trust him to go out there, defend takedowns, do this, do that, like it is, you know, a little bit concerning as well with uh and overall, it's not like it's impossible. It's an impossible task for someone to go out there and I'll grab them. So, card, we have, uh, I believe Ty's official nickname is the West Sydney Banger. Um, no, his, his nickname is Bam Bam. My bad. Yeah. His nickname yeah. is Bam Bam, but he has been called the West Sydney Banger. I believe he has called himself that, at least on numerous occasions. It's not the official nickname. Um, but, point being, his home country of Australia. One of the more popular guys from the region, taking on Jairzinho Rosenstrike. Frankly, this is two guys who... <laughs> also, we're going to put two strikers against each other and see what we get. Um, and that's what we have here. I think it's great matchmaking. I think it's going to be a fun fight. The favorite at minus 220. And... At plus one, have it. Um, what do you guys make of this fight, Jerry? I believe it is your turn to uh, lead us off. No shot. This makes it out of the first round. That's that's the only thing I have going through my mind in this fight. Is it's two guys. We'll look at Rosenstroik, thirteen knockout wins. Tui Vasa, thirteen knockout wins. Don't go to decision very often. I think they each have one t one decision win. I think it's like one loss and two losses for one of the other. So it doesn't go to decision. This fight's going to end in a knockout, and it's going to be something picturesque. I'll just tell you that much. And just mark it. If Tai Tuivasa not comes in and knocks out Jarzinho Rosenstroik like we know he possibly could, that crowd is going to erupt, and it's just going to be a boost for Dan Hooker the next fight, which – that's something that he may need from what we were saying the last one. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree. Me and Jared were kind of joking right before we started, too. Like, yeah, it has on paper, has ingredients. So much, there should be a knockout, should be entertaining. And then, you know, I'm not pessimistic, but I said sometimes that turns into a boring, too shy to throw on both sides, which hopefully shouldn't happen. But I don't know. Overall, it's tough because. I think Tui Vasa obviously is on a on a rough stretch of fights here, um, and so I'm inclined not to pick him. However, he was I think submitted in uh, two of those four losses, um, and then I mean th he was submitted in his last two, and then the the two before that were gone and Pavlovich. So also a sizable step down from that competition, I would say. So while I would while I want to go Rosenstrike and stuff, I think. You know, fighting, uh, fighting home country or close to home, um, you're fighting a, a brawler, someone that's going to strike you. Not going to have to worry about the submissions and anything. I mean, it, the stars are aligning for him to just catch him with one and you know turn that losing streak into um, into a, a highlight knockout and stuff. So I think this is one. It's heavyweight. You know, like we always say, one punch. It could go either way, but. Uh, I think if if you put this in Vegas though or something, I think I would be pretty decently on Rosenstrike side. It's kind of the outside factors maybe affecting this, making it closer to me. It is a lot of people are running off tied to Vasilis because he's lost four in a row. Um, but when you look at the guys that he's lost four in a row to, they're all either elite or have one of two skills. Like getting kicked in the body. So your guy went out there, kicked him in the body a lot. And that was after Ty almost knocked him out. Knocked him out. He knocked him down in that fight, almost won that fight. But he just couldn't deal with the body kicks. Cyril so got one of the best body kickers we've seen in the history of the heavyweight division. Sergey Pavlich, well, 
a tough fight when it's this massive, massive Russian who hits like a truck, and you're going to go out there and try and get in a 50-50 brawl? Hindsight. Volkov went out there, kicked him in the body a lot, and then took him down, and Ty can't grab him. So he was getting kicked in the body, which he cannot deal with, and then he got taken down and he can't grapple. So, not great. Took him down and he can't grapple, so he submitted him. Either body kicks or takedowns or having the power of Sergey Pavlik. Those are the themes. Jorginho Rosenstrike does not do a single one of those three things that have caused him to lose any of these four fights. Not one of them. Doesn't kick much. Kicks the legs, not the body. Not really. He hits hard, not that hard, and he doesn't grapple at all. So, already makes this a closer fight than people suggest. Side, everyone's so ready to say Shamil Gaziev sucks. That was his most recent one. Almeida, because Rosenstruck can't grapple. So, there's a lot of similarities here. Then he knocks out Chris Dawkins. Chris Dawkins in the octagon. By knockout. Dawkins ended up going down to lay heavy, heavyweight. Then it's loss of Volkov. Blades, because he can't grapple. And then it's a win against the Augustus, Augustus guy who Ty also beat. So, a better of a run aside from beating two guys who everyone thinks suck. One of them's not even in the UFC anymore. So, um, I just think a lot of people are so they're just picking Rosenstrike by default when I kind of think Ty wins. Um, one of the main reasons is you'll see Ty go out there, get in the clinch, go out there, land clinch knockouts. Knocked out Derek Lewis in the clinch. Well, he can't clinch against guys who can grapple him because they'll just take him down. So he can go out there and clinch. Land big shots out of the clinch. He's Rosenstrike. Rosenstrike's pretty small, heavyweight, short, not that big. Ty Tuivasa, tall. Bad as shit. Swings hard. Like, there's just a lot of things that I think either favor Tuivasa or there's things that don't favor Tuivasa that aren't present. So, that's a long... I'm taking the upset in this one for Tuivasa. Tuivasa, because you always love to see him get a knockout in Australia, but um, I think he wins. I think the logic tracks as well. I 100%, like we are saying... Um... Or like Jerry, like you said, there might even be some carryover to if he gets the knockout for Hooker, which would be cool. But this is one, like, ideally, hopefully we just see a little firefight. And I don't want to say hopefully we see a knockout, but there's, you know, very good chance for that. Um, but, yeah, this is this is the one where when they have these fight cards in different countries and stuff like that, like, this is the one where you kind of hope, like, Tui Vasa gets the knockout just because the atmosphere and watching that, uh, like, on the actual fight night and, and watching that for the main event is something that, you know, you get a huge pop from the crowd. Just makes everything more fun um, overall and stuff. So. Yeah, these are the kind of fighters we love seeing in their home countries with their home crowds behind them. It's Simple as that. It's like why England loves watching Tom Aspinall fight there because you know he's going to go out and try and flatten someone as quickly as he can. And I haven't seen a shoey in a while too. Yeah, that's always that always because <laughs> those those were fun, and then we haven't got to see one in a while. But so stop. <laughs> yeah. Last fight of this main card, we have Carlos Prates versus Li Jingliang. Prates two and zero in the UFC. Two knockouts, the Inouye Contender Series guy um, from last season. Um, Li Jingliang has low-key been for a pretty long time. Um, and he's just kind of always been a guy who, well, shouldn't say always. More recently, he's been a guy who's ranked in the bottom portion of the rankings. Outside the rankings? Or not, excuse me, sitting just outside the rankings. Um be right around those rankings at welterweight. So, massive step up in competitions for the Dana White Contender Series fighter. And him as a pretty big favorite. Um, 285. So, biggest favorite on the main card is Carlos Prates, not Mateusz Gamera, which I think is uh, 
interesting just because Gamrot's always, you know, seems to be a massive favorite. So biggest main card favorite is Carlos Prates. Um, Anthony, it's your turn to lead us off. Um, what do you make of Prates getting the stuff up in competition and, and takes on the main card opener? Yeah, I uh, I think it's deserved too, and I think that's um a better one out of because you know a lot of more people coming in through the contender series and stuff. Um, I think he's a good one from that to get a boost and stuff like that. Um, but I just think that sucks for Leach to um you know everything. I think we said this um one of these podcasts, but um when, you know, when he was all dressed up in his suit and stuff and never even got the chance, like that was such an important moment for him, for someone that is consistently stuck around almost being ranked lower part of the rankings, you know, does these certain things, but never got that huge pop. And that was his chance. And then just deals with uh, injuries. Um, you know, some unfortunate injuries too, I think is what led into uh, that big time off. And then they give him like a killer in a sense, not, not someone, not a world beater, but I'm saying, I mean, he's two. Yeah. Would you say two and two, uh, two knockouts, two finishes uh, for practice. Yeah. So I just think that that's a tough, um, you know, tough fight back from injury and after everything that happened, but uh, overall though, uh, very interested. I think um, it's a good, good sign on the, to be an opener for Perantes. And then, if, if Leach uh, can get the win here, nothing wrong with coming back after a couple of years off and getting a, you know, a big win on a, on our pay-per-view card to start uh, or to start the pay-per-view card. But yeah. Yeah. Both of these guys are in a great position to make a big name for themselves on this card. James, you mentioned earlier, anytime it's an Israel out of Sanya fight pay-per-view wise, it seems like people still watching more people, more casuals are watching because they know who he is. And this is one of those fights that I'm leaning Prates. He's won the last eight in a row by knockout or TKO. So he is a massive, massive dangerous threat out there. And the leech, I want to see I want to see him win. I just don't see it happening because I want to see him fight. I had I completely forgot it was it's been over two coming up on two years since he last fought. It'd be good to see him get a win back in the octagon, but I just think Protes is too much and kind of he's the fresher fighter as well, I'll say. So that's my my concern for that. To the unfortunate of Li Jing Liang. Um didn't get to wear the suit was the uh the uh Diaz Chimaev original was the original bout order and they had the brawl Tony Ferguson on that card to the press conference. He's supposed to fight Tony Ferguson. It gets switched up. He weighs in at 170. They shuffle that whole card and to fight Nate, and he gets to fight D-Rod, who was supposed to fight Holland. And he and Lee 70. So they fight at 180, and then Lee wins the fight, and they score it for D-Rod. So that, that whole week was a tough one. That's why he's sitting on a split decision Ross the D-Rod instead of Probably a knockout win against Ferguson um, if that week goes differently for him. So, um, there for, for Jing Liang. And, you know, he's a guy who he's fighting in practice. He also fought Chimaev, uh in his recent uh, run of fights. I mean, Chimaev is a was a more highly talented prospect than Prates, but – this isn't the first time he said, yeah, I'll take on that guy that a lot of people haven't heard of that is looks really, really good. So it's not even the first time he's done this. So uh, lots of credit to Lee. Um, uh, this was my, just the run I've had with Prates, Contender Series. He wins. Yeah. But before the knockout. And then in this next fight, he's fighting Charles Radke. Charles Radke is like a plus 200 underdog in the fight prior. And I was like, maybe I'll just do it again. And then I just said, screw it and picked against Prates because I was worried he wouldn't throw enough value. Then he went out there and looked 10 times better and got the knockout quicker against Radke. So um, I don't really think I want to doubt uh, Prates again. I doubted him a little bit in his last fight, even though I did like him originally. 
Um, and I felt really, really, really stupid uh, when I picked against him and he won by knockout. Um, and um, so I think he wins this fight. He's very, very precise. Sniper likes striking. I think he lands a shot that knocks out Li Jing Liang. But the, the low volume does concern me if he can't find that shot. Um, I also will say I'm not as um, – does that minus 360 line would um, tell you. Big, but like I said, I do think he wins. So um, that was kind of my thought there and my thought process. Like I said, picking practice, but I think we're getting a little bit head over heels because Li Jing Liang is a good fighter. So that's on you. Say, I think these prelims are slightly slim, so much, but um, we. Um, do you guys have anything that you are looking forward to, as far as uh, prelims, or even if it's uh, something on the main card that you want to touch on um, for a final thought? Regardless, um, Jerry, we can throw it over to you first. Um, what are you looking at for uh, some final thoughts? I mean, let's just say. The top of family fighting has been very, very interesting in 2024. First, it was Justin Toffa, or I think it might have been Junior Toffa was meant to fight. He's the one fighting this weekend. He pulled out, was replaced by his brother. Then more recently, a couple months ago, his brother Justin Toffa pulls out of a fight. Junior steps in on one day's notice, gets kind of finished in that second round, but it was one of those things that he was just completely out of shape, completely unprepared for it. This fight, I think, could be very fun. All six of Tafa's seven fights have ended in a knockout. Valter Walker has plenty of knockouts of his own right. I think he has six wins by knockout. So this is one that I'm looking to wrap up the prelims with. Some big guys swinging and banging. Um, my fight before that then, before that one, uh, to – or a little lower on the prelims would be uh, Luana Santos. Um, doesn't matter. I don't know, you know, people's feelings on women's MMA and stuff, but uh, I was able to watch actually uh, Santos in her debut fight and uh, all her two other ones after that. And uh, I've been, you know, pretty entertained through. I think she has a submission, uh, a finish, and then a decision, of course. But, um, you know, got it done through striking and through um, – and with the submission, and I've, uh, I think Casey O'Neill is a, is a fine fighter. N nothing, um, you know, not a top notch, top tier of women's MMA, but overall, I think, um, and it's pretty decently high on the prelims too, actually. So I think they know. I think Lawana just has uh, some potential to be um, star, a star. I'm sorry, to be pushed a little bit more too for women's MMA because I would say I've seen her do the rounds on uh, social media too. And stuff like that so she's a bit uh marketable too and then she backs it up in the octagon so far as we've seen so that's uh besides the main card and i don't know if uh james is going to talk about the ramos kulabal fight so i'll leave that with uh the santos will just be the one then this was uh one of my two um i think that's uh, my favorite fight in the prelims I genuinely, generally uh, lean towards the featherweights as well. Um, I just enjoy watching the featherweights fight. And Cully Bao is a guy who's had some exciting fights in the UFC. Ramos as well. Ramos is a little bit on the more volatile side. Sometimes he'll go out there and look good. Sometimes he'll go out there and go, what the hell am I watching? And he goes out there and gets finished. So um, I think that kind of clash of styles leads to a fun fight. Um, I will also shout out. Um, Jack Jenkins, I believe this is his first fight back since uh, breaking his arm against um, Chepe Mariscal. Um, so the devastating injury where he snapped that arm um, in the clinch during a throw. His comeback fight, Herbert Burns. So uh, hey, you snapped your arm. Here's Herbert Burns. Uh, you're a minus 1,000 favorite. Um, don't know if he's actually a minus thousand favorite. He is 
a hundred. So I was close, but not not quite. Uh, didn't quite get an hundred percent. But um, that's another fight that I just think there's a level of interest there. Seeing a guy come back from a pretty devastating act, uh, in octagon injury. So um, I think that is uh, another guy that uh, or another fight that I'm looking at just purely based off that. So. I'm curious what – we always like bringing up the betting odds. I'm curious what the betting odds are that Gilbert Burns carries out Herbert after the fight again. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that doesn't happen. I say uh, yeah. I think Gilbert's going to stay that. home while he trains for a Sean Brady fight. He's in that, the training that, camp. That would probably be the smart yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Especially when – isn't that fight around the corner? Weeks. I think that's uh, within four weeks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he probably won't be making the trip down under then. You never know. That image in my head: Gilbert carrying out his crying brother out of the octagon. We have a lot of siblings on this card: Junior Taffa, Walter. Was that Johnny Walker's brother? Is it? Yeah. Um. Honestly, and though, then, it is a pretty good card. And, so. and then DDP and Adesanya are brothers too. So yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah, much. I think that's how, I think that's how that works. If you look at genetics and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Card um, um, main card is uh, a, a really good pay per view card in my opinion. Um, solid card. Prelims, it's a little fifty fifty. Uh, making sure they get all their local talent on the card. Prelims, uh, early prelims, a little bit more for the Australian and Oceanic audiences um, than the U.S. audiences, and that's as to be expected. We will be back next week breaking down this card. Um, next week's uh, – uh, we might have a break week next week. I'm not sure if there's a fight night. If it is, it's that Cannoneer and Baralho one. Um, and yeah, that that is so. that is next weekend. It's on the uh, pay per view breakdown. Uh, we'll have a lot to discuss as we talked about earlier with Izzy and Duplicy. It's a pretty important fight. Um, important stuff to sift through uh, when we come back. Uh, if you're looking for more content on the card, we'll have preview and best bets out on Friday. Last week, we I personally made the call to cut the cut the best bets because i hey i looked and there were no best bets <laughs> you shouldn't have been betting on that card so there was no post but uh this week best bets will be out um so you can look out for that so thank you for tuning in make sure to like and subscribe and make sure to head to vendetta sports media to catch all of our other content we'll see you next